Hey everyone, welcome back to the other side of weight loss. So we're talking about the carnivore diet today, which is something that I've been implementing in my own practice for the last year with certain clients. I'm not the expert on it, but I'm really digging it and I'm digging the results I'm getting with my clients. So today I've got like the king of carnivore here, Dr. Sean Baker. Sean is a lifelong multi-sport elite level athlete and a medical doctor who served as a combat trauma surgeon and chief of orthopedics while deployed to Afghanistan with the United States Air Force. His focus in recent years has been on using the carnivore diet as a tool for for health, performance, and overall well-being. You can find Sean at Sean forward slash baker.com. Welcome, Sean. Karen, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Sean's at his ranch, as you can see, with his cows grazing in the background. They're not moving, but they are there. <laughs> yeah, they're too scared to move. <laughs> no, I wish I had a ranch. Now this obviously is a little little green screen thing, but uh yeah, no, I, uh, you know, it's, it's fun. I, I talked with Joel Salatin a while ago on our podcast. I love him. It was really inspiring. And so, I mean, if, if ever, if things work out for me in life, maybe one day I'll end up with a, with my own ranch because uh, he I is I so inspiring. I should have him on my podcast. I never even thought of him before, but I mean, let's just, talk, like, he was the first person that kind of debunked that whole myth of if you're eating red meat, you're harming the environment. But if, and then he talks about the fact that if we were actually all eating grass-fed beef, it wouldn't be the case, would it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and I just I just spoke with uh, Bobby Gill from the Savory Institute today, in fact. And I mean, there is not only does properly, and again, this is a key, it's, not, it's yes. not the cow, it's a how, but properly uh, managed livestock can not only contribute to less greenhouse and carbon, uh, uh, you know, uh, emissions, but it can actually do the reverse. It can actually have a let a net negative effect so that they build soil and build carbon and no other, no, there's no other way to do that. And so it is something that I think we should all be getting behind in any way that we possibly can. And, 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 as, and the more and more ranchers that employ this, the better off our future is going to be because we have Somewhere in the estimates, the FAO estimates about 60 harvests left until our soil degradation makes, basically makes us largely impossible to grow food. And so we've got to dramatically reverse the soil degradation that's happening due to, you know, large monocropping. And, and the way to do that is property, properly manage ruminant animals, you know, you know, done in a holistic and regenerative fashion. Yeah. And he's the guy. So if you're wondering how to do that. You go, can go check him out on like every food documentary there is, I think. He's the guy. So, Sean, how long have you been eating a carnivore-based diet for? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I think, two years, and I'm in my yeah. two years and eighth month. So, close, getting close to three years now. And so, I still oh. somehow manage not to die. And yeah. <laughs> Kirby has it's still looking good, down. right? You still got yeah, all your muscle. Yeah, still hanging on the muscle. <laughs> I, I haven't had any... My colon hasn't fallen out because of lack of fiber. and Your heart uh, hasn't exploded. My heart, yeah. I had, a, I had my coronary artery calcium scan done recently, showed perfectly clean coronary arteries. And so, I mean, it's uh, the, the sort of predictions have surprisingly uh, not, you know, come to pass. Yeah. And it's, uh, because our, you know, our nutritional research is basically very much lacking in, in true science. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing not only me, but, you know, as you're probably aware, thousands upon thousands of other people that are doing the exact same thing with very similar results, which is pretty much by and large getting healthier, which I think is very exciting for, for a lot of people. Exciting. So for those that are listening that have like never heard of con what the heck is the carnivore diet or have, you know, maybe heard the rumors, can you just break it down what that consists of? Being a yeah, and so I, I just gave a talk at uh, Keto Fest and then Paleo Fest uh, just before that, and you know, as I just wrote the book, the Carnivore Diet, I, I have, I think I have some liberty in, in which what the way I want to define it. Yes. So the, way, the way I like to define it is it is a it is a diet that focuses on nutrient dense animal based nutrition, which then will either limit or eliminate plant derived material as needed for the purpose of improving health. And so that sort of says that, you know, basically you're eating a lot of animal-based food and you might have some plants in there depending on your to individual tolerance. Some people, for some people, it's a complete 100%, you know, meat-based meat diet, which is almost pretty much what I do. I'm, I'm probably 99.9% .9 
uh, meat based with very, you know, spices is probably the only exception that I, that I particularly do. But yeah, I mean, it, it is, it is a complete opposite of what we've been told to do. It is, uh, as opposed to our currently plant-based diets, and this is a big, huge misconception in the United States, 70% of our foods are plant-based foods and we have a, you know, and the rest comes from meat, eggs, milk, and dairy or meat, meat, meat eggs, milk, and other dairy um seafood and so on and so forth but the majority of our calories in the united states and in most western countries come from plant-based sources now the majority of that is wheat soy corn uh sugar and seed oils which is probably the, the big problem and and you know so when we have people saying well the meat's killing us um it's it's really not it's really really not and so yeah, when not we, when you break when you hear it like that what we're, we're actually eating and we're, we're dying of heart disease well, 70% of our diet's coming from plant-based. Well, what does that say, right? Yeah. So, and why, what drove you to switch to being carnivore? Well, I mean, it was a, it was a sort of a culmination of about a decade of sort of experimentation with nutrition. You know, I was, uh, so I'm 52 now, so probably in my early 40s. You know, having been a lifelong athlete, and, and much of it was time spent as a strength athlete. So by necessity, I needed to be very big and strong. And so I'm six foot five. And so I was probably, oh, good, 280, 290 pounds and, and, and competing well in my sport. I was at that time a Highland Games world champion. So I had to throw these big, you know, cavers, which look like telephone poles and these giant weights where you spin around and throw 56 pound weights with one arm and throwing hammers and all these crazy things, shot putting. Um, you know, this is after a lifelong life of strength training where I was a national record holder in, in weight powerlifting and uh, uh, strongman sports where I was a pretty decent strongman athlete. And so I, I got to the, my early 40s and I noticed that um, I just wasn't uh, doing well health-wise. I mean, I was starting and it wasn't that I was morbidly obese. I mean, I was 280, but I carried it well. I was, no one would look at me and say I was obese. They would just say he's just a big, strong guy. But at the same time, I was developing signs of fleet sleep apnea, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, Wow. Um, you know, energy was low and I was, I was a full-time orthopedic surgeon, you know, very busy, successfully doing all that stuff and still, still su successfully uh, competing as an athlete and still training extremely hard. I mean, it wasn't like I stopped training. Uh, and then I realized that I had to uh, play with nutrition because prior to that, I felt that I could eat, you know, kind of whatever I want as long as I trained hard. That was my philosophy, eat dessert first because you never know when you're going to die. You know, I'll go to the gym and I'll train off everything that I, that I do. So I would justify eating suboptimal foods by training hard. And I think a lot of people do that. A lot of people, there's the, the length that people will do so they can eat enough sugar uh, to justify it either through excessive exercise or other rationalizations is, is amazing. And I was no different. And so uh, when I got there and I realized that that wasn't, that strategy was not working anymore, it eventually caught up with me. I, I went on a dietary journey. And the first thing I did was what I thought was what you're supposed to do. And so I um, started eating low fat, high fiber, lots of fruits and vegetables, very lean proteins, reduced my calories, uh, I increased my ex exercise output, surprisingly that I could. I mean, I was up uh, in the morning jumping rope, a couple thousand jump ropes, went to lunch, did a little workout, you know, between, on my lunch hour, came home, jumped rope again, did that, reduced my caloric intake by about half. I mean, you got to remember at the time I was eating probably 8,000 calories a day to maintain oh, wow. Yeah. It was. And so I dropped down to what most people would see in a reasonable amount of, you know, three to 4,000 calories a day. And, and, you know, I, I dropped 50 pounds in three months, you know, it just came right off. I had, I'm, I'm a very disciplined guy. I'm an athlete. I, I you know, when, when, when it's go time, I'll just do whatever I need to do. Mm -hmm. And so it worked. I got down to, I went from 280 to about 230, 235. I was very lean. I looked good. I was muscular. Um, I was also not a good person. I was not a happy person. I was pissed you were off. Angry nurses, all the time. <laughs> yeah, I was hungry all the time. The nurses said we prefer the more rotund Dr. Baker better. <laughs> and so I realized that that was not sustainable. I could not continue on that style of diet or the exercise regimen that, that was required. And so at that point, I started looking at other options. I discovered the, the Paleolithic diet that was popular at the time. This is again, this is about eight nine years ago. And did that for a while and, and found that to be certainly more sustainable, more enjoyable. And then as I kind of gotten more interested in nutrition itself, I, I began reading and started getting involved in low carbohydrate diets. Um, uh, eventually ended up on a ketogenic diet for several years and then started employing it in my practice with my patients and started to know some very sort of odd things were happening. I was seeing people that we're on the schedule for a knee replacement and I put them on a ketogenic diet in order to lose weight prior to surgery. And all of a sudden their knee pain would go completely away. 
and we had to end up canceling their surgeries. And so I thought that was very, very unique. Mm-hmm. And then it's just, I kind of did that for several years. And then as I kind of just was really still an athlete wanting to look at performance, it just somehow I started reading about the fact that people were using, you know, meat heavy diets in the past for, for uh, improvements in athletic performance. And I was always a guy that's always competed without drugs or hormones and didn't want to go that route. And so I was trying to look at any sort of quote unquote natural way by doing that. And so I discovered sort of the Vince Garanda steak and eggs diet. So I started employing that, you know, as he would, which would be four or five days in a row. And then, then you would refeed with carbohydrates. And so I did that. And this is after doing different versions of the ketogenic diet, which were cyclic and targeted and carb backloading and all the different iterations of ways to, to cycle carbs in and out. Uh, but, but, you know, as I started to notice the days that I was on the steak and eggs, I felt really good. And then when I carb loaded or went back on the sort of the cheat day, I just didn't feel as good. And so I, I kind of kept playing this with this for about six months. And then finally in 2016, I said, I'm going to do a, a fully meat-based diet. I don't even know if I call it the carnivore diet back then. It was like a meat-only diet for a month. And I was on social media at the time and everybody had, we kind of laughed about it. We had jokes that we took polls on when I was going to die of, when I was going to get scurvy. And, and so I did the month and I mean, you know, other than a little bit of an adaptation period in the first week where I had a little bit of a headache, um, it went really well. I actually felt really good. I started to see some inc- increased, you know, it continued improvements in my health. And then when the 30 days were up, I went back to the ketogenic diet I was on and I incorporated some more foods back in and I just, I honestly didn't feel as good. And so I was just like, you know, having already realized that fat is not bad for me and cholesterol is not going to kill me. And a lot of the nutritional sort of, sort of dogma out there is basically garbage. I decided that I would rather feel good and perform good than, than, than not. And so I went back to the all meat diet and here I am, you know, over two years into it, you know, almost close, closer to three years later and still just, you know, really happy and thriving. And you just, are you kind of going with your intuition and get how you're feeling to know whether or not like, okay, maybe it's time I start to incorporate some vegetables or fruits back in or something, or are you just like, this is it for life? No, I, I, I would hesitate. I mean, I, I don't think anybody should ever say this is the only thing you're going to do. I'm mm-hmm. certainly reactive to, you know, what's going on. And I do think that despite what, uh, you know, much of medicine teaches us, we can listen to our bodies to know if we're healthy. I mean, we shouldn't, I mean, we should be able to look in the mirror and certainly say that, you know, I mean, and this is a mirror, a literal, a figurative sense. You can look in the mirror and say, I'm healthier. I feel better. I'm, you know, I'm less tired. My mood is better. I'm less depressed. Certainly the, the actual mirror, you can look at your body composition. You can see that your joints hurt less. You can feel that your digestion is better. You can feel that your performance in the gym is better. Your libido is better. Your, you know, everything about you, as long as it's going well, then, then I think that's the, the, the sort of the barometer that I like to use in order to change things. And so yeah. I'm not at all opposed to someone doing this and then adding other foods back in as needed. I mean, certainly around athletic activities, I, I advise people all the time that, you know, you might find a, a, a source of carbohydrates may be beneficial. I, I haven't found that to be the case for me. Uh, and maybe that'll change down the road. Um, I'm not going to limit myself or paint myself in the corner or, and I'm not attached to any sort of dogma or religion. Uh, if I want to have a, you know, if, if say this fall, there's some ripe, you know, blackberries that, that, that are seasonal that I want to have. I'm not going to restrict myself from having that. Now, if, if I eat them and I don't feel very good, then maybe I won't do that. But I mean, uh, but yeah, generally, I mean, I am, like I said, 99.9% is either meat, fish, eggs and, and a tiny, tiny bit of dairy is what I do day in and day out. And uh, right now it's working well. So I'll continue doing it as long as it's working well for me. And, and I enjoy it, you know? Yeah. And you probably, you're a doctor. You say so you've just tested all your health markers and I'm assuming they're all good to go. Yeah. I mean, I've looked at uh, what I consider to be relevant and, and looked and interpret them in, in the proper clinical context because, uh, you know, my LDL cholesterol is 140 you know, which some people would, some people would be concerned about. I mean, I know enough to know that that in light of the fact that I'm extremely insulin sensitive in light of the fact that my, uh, my, uh, C-reactive protein is extremely low in light of the fact that my uh, triglycerides are very low. My, my HDL is, 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 you know, high enough that, that, uh, my you know, lipoprotein little A is extremely, all the, all the metrics out there. And more importantly that my coronary artery calcium scan was a perfect zero. 
Perfect. I mean, I'm not concerned with what's going on with my health. I mean, I'm, I'm probably, if you, if you line me up against most 52 year old males on the planet, I'm going to be one of the healthiest ones around. I can, I can, yeah. I can fairly confidently say that doesn't mean I'm immune from disease or death, but I think I'm pretty well above where, where most people are at my age. Yeah. Now from an evolutionary standpoint, how, like, I mean, we would have eaten a lot of meat as a hunter gatherer, right? So are we trying to kind of mimic that idea of maybe going a step beyond the paleo diet and kind of mimicking that fact that we would have eaten a lot of animal protein and maybe at least not in the winter in, in this area would we have been eating vegetables or fruit? Yeah. I mean, if we look at realistically in Canada, you're not going to get, you're not going to get mangoes and bananas no. at any time in the year, but I mean, certainly not in the winter, but yeah, I mean, I think you can look at that in that framework to sort of maybe give you some plausibility, but at the end of the day, what I try to tell people is you have to go with what results you're getting today in 2019. Yes. This is the most important part. It doesn't matter where you sort of, sort of get the theory on why your diet may or may not work. Now, if we want to talk about evolution, I mean, clearly there is ample evidence that human beings ate animals and we ate them in large quantities. I mean, I think that's fairly clear. Now, were we 100% carnivorous? Um, no. I think that's a hard argument to make. I do yeah. think that we at times were, I think, and Same. those times might've been for very long times and certainly through parts of the year. Um, I think that, you know, animal nutrition can give us everything we need to survive and, and thrive. And I think the, the, the populations that, that did do that and leaned on that heavily tended to be some of the uh, most robust humans that ever walked the planet. Now, most people don't know that, but about, uh, you know, 10, 12,000 years ago when we adopted agriculture, prior to that, we relied on primarily hunting and then gathering as a supplement, but primarily hunting. And we had um, access to well, up until about 50 to 25,000 years ago, we had access to something called the megafauna, which were these enormous animals, which were, you know, just basically walking all you can eat meat buffets. I mean, they were huge, huge animals and they were everywhere and we were very effective at hunting them. And so we did that until we over hunted them and they, they disappeared. And anywhere that humans expanded throughout the world, starting about 50,000 years ago, as human populations sort of kind of reached a threshold, uh, and we were able to, you know, have enough hunting pressure to to to, to cause the demise and extinction of many of these animals. Uh, we saw that happen, and so once that happened, uh, we had to rely more on a plant-based diet. And then eventually, we developed agriculture again around twelve, ten thousand years ago. And as we saw, if we look at the skeletal records, when we look at humans from fifty thousand years ago, and we compare them at humans at about ten thousand years ago after the adaptation of agriculture, uh, it is clear that humans became smaller, they're, they're, our size shrunk by six inches, our bones became weaker, our, de our teeth started to have problems. We saw all kinds of bony uh, diseases and also very importantly, our brain size actually shrunk by about 200 cc, so about the size of a tennis ball. We lost about that much brain power uh, when we adopted a plant-based diet and we left the sort of a more meat-based diet. So I think there is, a, yeah. there is a strong evolutionary argument we can look at the data out of the Max Planck Institute where they look at stable radioisotope data and they can look at the nitrogen levels in uh, uh, collagen that they can find in the bones and they can tell exactly what we are eating relative to other animals. And we see that when we compare uh, Ice Age humans, which existed from almost all of humanity, you know, remember we existed in an Ice Age for almost the entirety of the 200, 300,000 or even 400,000 years that we think Homo sapiens may have walked the planet most of that was ice age and so we see that when we compare ourselves to other animals our level of uh animal protein consumption either equaled or exceeded that of other uh, carnivorous animals like wolves and hyenas and other animals and so we were extremely carnivorous at some point at least yeah. through much of the world so i think it's not implausible to suggest that that is kind of our evolutionary heritage yeah absolutely and for those listening I, i'm you guys know that I'm a firm believer that we all need to find what is the perfect diet for you and what you're dealing with. And if you go into Sean's site, you're going to see a ton of testimonials. And Sean, I would just love for you to tell, you know, tell our listeners what kind of ailments and issues are being solved by, like what are the most common things that are being solved uh, through the carnivore diet? Why would somebody want to eat meat only? 
Yeah, so that's a, that's a great, uh, great question. And I mean, I would say not to sound sort of too crazy, but most things, chronic diseases seem to get better. And, and certainly, I think there's a lot of things that, you know, share a similar, uh, you know, root cause etiology. And, and much of it can be attributed to uh, metabolic syndrome. And we can define that a number of different ways. And I also think uh, there is a disruption in the gut uh, and their so-called leaky gut syndrome. So I think the carnivore diet certainly helps with insulin sensitization, insulin regularization, glucose stabilization. I think it helps to really f fix for many people metabolic syndrome, and then it also helps to restore gut integrity. And so I think when we look, when we branch out from that, we see things like diabetes, we see things like hypertension, we see things like um, uh, autoimmune conditions like psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, eczema, uh, allergies, uh, even some mental health disorders. In fact, just because of the frequency that we see them in the population, the, the three biggest things that I see uh, get better on the diet tend to be uh, mood and mental health. That seems to be a big one. Digestive issues seem to get improved. So people with irritable, irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease or just general, you know, maladaptive digest, digestion. And then the other thing would be joint pain. Those things seem to just go away pretty consistently and pretty reliably in most people. And like I said, I've seen, you know, some of the more amazing things I've seen, even people with genetic disorders. And we had a gal, uh, she's another physician. In fact, she's out of uh, uh, Denmark, I believe. Her name's Dawn Layton. We did a podcast with her and she had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. It's, it's genetic disorder. And so she spent her entire life and she's 58, her entire adult life was spent every day waking up with anywhere between one and four joints completely dislocated oh. in pain because she'd move around in bed and her joints would pop out of socket. So she would have to wake up, put her joints back in place. And after time, she, she was able to do that because they're so loose. You just got to shove them back in place. And arthritis because of the repeated dislocations. And within a month of going on the carnivore diet, and she's been on it for a year now, she's had zero dislocations. And this is after a lifetime of doing this stuff. So it has been, you know, very much uh, just pretty darn amazing to me to see what, it, what, it, what it's been able to do for people. Well, let's talk about the people though that are that have tried an autoimmune protocol, who have tried keto and have gone down to ten grams of carbohydrates. Because this is these are the people that I'm working with. That you know they've been diligent. I had one woman who had been like hardcore keto for six months, and her blood she was still type two diabetic. Her insulin was through the roof. Like it was terrible. And so I said, "Okay, try carnivore for a month." And she came back, and all her norm all her numbers went back to normal. And she had been down to to almost no carbohydrates. So why is it like people like yourself and this woman and many other people that I've worked with can do these restrictive diets that are supposed to fix these problems, these metabolic disorders, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune conditions, leaky gut. And for a lot of people, it does. A large population of people, it absolutely fixes those problems. And then you have these people that it doesn't get better. If, some, if anything, some people get worse. Like I've seen people on autoimmune conditions or protocols that either flourish or they can get worse. And they still, and then suddenly they're reacting to everything they put in their mouth and, and it just becomes intolerable as far as eating goes. So why is it that taking plant, all plant matter out completely, why does that shift it? Well, I mean, I think the honest answer is we don't know for sure, but I mean, there's certainly uh, some, some, some decent theories out there and some data that would support those theories. And in fact, uh, you know, I talked with Rob Wolf the other day in our podcast and Rob was the creator of the, uh, the, the autoimmune protocol for paleo, you know, and, and he basically says, I think carnivore is better. And so, wow. um, I, I think that what we see is, you know, we've got this sort of perception belief that, you know, all vegetables are great. You know, they're, they're, they do no wrong. They're wonderful for us. We should all eat as many as we possibly can. That's been drummed into our head. You know, you know, my mother did that and your grandmother did that. It's, it's, this is something, and, and, you know, the nutritionists kind of tell us this over the time, you know, to all the time. And, you know, some of the epidemiology supports that stuff and the epidemiology is not particularly good science. But the honest answer is that, um, you know, these plants have compounds in them, you know, that, I mean, if we think about it, if I, I've got this picture of this background picture and I look at the grass and the, and the trees out there, and if I were to go eat any of that stuff, I would get dramatically sick because most plants have chemicals in them that make us sick. We're not designed to eat them. It's no different from the food we eat. The food we've been, that we eat now, and most vegetables, as most people don't know, most vegetables are a modern creation. They were hybridized out of weeds 
and we found a little bit of part that was not as bitter and not as acutely toxic. And so we found that we could get some nourishment out because you can eat grass and get nourishment. I mean, you, you can do it the same way as a cow. You're not very efficient at it, not very effective, and you'll upset your stomach. But there is still nutrition in there. There's still glucose in there. But so we found these plants that were less sort of problematic for us. Now, less doesn't mean completely without harm. And so the problem becomes, do we now have a situation where a hundred years ago, people could have eaten, uh, you know, certain fruits and vegetables and been completely fine. And maybe because we've so dramatically changed those fruits and vegetables from their original source, it maybe that's introduced a problem, but also just as likely in my view is the modern environment of the seed oils, the, the the artificial sweeteners, the sugars in high doses, the refined grains, the, the chemicals and the preservatives and the things that keep things on the shelves for 15 years and make them shelf stable have now compromised our, our gut and other immune system in a way that now exposure to what otherwise would be a relatively innocuous dose of oxalate, which we find in spinach or uh, phytate, which we find in, you know, beans and legumes or, you know, lectins or, you know, goitrogens, what we find in cruciferous vegetables, perhaps those would have been previously something we would have had a better chance of defending against. And now because of the leaky gut, because of these other things, these things now become problematic. And I think we have to sort of, you know, be objective about it and say, you know, hey, maybe vegetables are good in this particular situation for this particular person. But for some people, like you said, that are suffering from autoimmune diseases, it could be that they've got to eliminate those things and and, and kind of go, you know, sort of very aggressive against that. And I, I find that, uh, you know, realizing that broccoli wasn't introduced into the 19, to the United States till the 1920s. I mean, people don't, you tell them that, and they're like, oh, no, I thought humans have been eating broccoli for 50,000 years. No, the thing was invented. You know, it wasn't introduced into Europe, introduced into Europe till the 1800s. And it was kind of invented in Italy a couple thousand years ago. But that's a very short period of time that humans have actually been eating these, these substances. And you can show that with almost most of the modern fruits and vegetables in the grocery store did not exist at all or, or certainly not in their current form. So, yeah. uh, but what we were eating were animals. I mean, we know that. And a cow today is still, I mean, it, well, it's not exactly an orc. You know, cows were domesticated and bred, you know, 10,000 years ago. Thankfully, we would be starving because we killed all the good animals and now we're left yes. with cows. And so, um, but their meat is still generally largely the same. It hasn't changed. Meat is still meat. You know, it hasn't changed in quantity. I mean, in, in nature that much. People argue that we raise it a little different. We feed them a little different. And, you know, we give things to the animals to, to make them more efficiently bigger and fatter. But still the meat is pretty similar to what it was, you know, much more so than things that didn't even exist 50,000 years ago, like broccoli and cauliflower and, uh, you know, kale, which no one was eating a hundred years ago. I mean, no one would eat that stuff. I mean, I don't know why people eat it today. Quite honestly, it just tastes awful, but I know it's what we're told is good for us. So we eat it. And, and I, I, I just find that sort of hard to believe that something that's so bitter and awful tasting is something we're supposed would have, would have voluntarily included in our diet. You think about it. Yeah. No. Lost in the woods, you know, in the woods, not the grocery store, but the woods and there's bitter leaves that have literally no caloric value. You're not going to get anything. Why on earth would you possibly eat that? I mean, there's really no reason. And humans wouldn't have. They would have eaten bugs. They would have eaten. They would have eaten some fruit if they came across it. You know, but they wouldn't have come across it that often. Certainly not in the quantities or the amounts we see today. But they would have eaten every animal they could possibly catch. That's clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that? Because when was fire? When did fire come in? Because would we have eaten raw animal meat up until then? Basically, well, we yeah, would have course, had to, yeah. right? Or dried. I yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. We, we, you know, so Homo erectus, which was on Earth for about 1.8 uh, million years, and they came into existence, you know, around two million years ago or so, and and they were kind of the first sort of adept hunters, and so that that's kind of the one where where our brain started to develop. You know, we started out as Australopithecus, and we became Homo habilis, and there's different, you know, sort of theories on which one came next and so on and so forth. But Homo erectus clearly was in our line and they drove, they were one of the great, the great leap they made was hunting and they learned how to kill these mammoths and they killed it with the technology had was just a spear. They were easily able to do it. Uh, they dried the meat in the sun. They, you know, if they were in the cold places, like when they migrated into Asia and Europe, they would have uh, put it in the snow or they put it underwater. These are all ancient preservation techniques. And so we have, you know, the ability to do that. But 
Yeah, I mean, to answer your question, yeah, humans ate raw meat for a long, long time. And still, there's people that still eat it today. If you go to a fancy French restaurant, you order steak tartare on the menu, that's raw meat. And I've eaten it. And it's delicious. You, you can completely <laughs> digest it. There's no reason we can't. Well, let me, let me put a caveat to that because um, normal human beings with normal gastrointestinal function have extremely acidic stomachs. This is what is one of the evolutionary adaptations we had to meat eating. If you look at us compared to every other animal out there, our gastric pH in a normal, I say normal human, is about 1.5, which is extremely low, which means a very acidic environment. And we compare that to a lion, which is, whose gastric pH is 2 to 3, uh, a monkey or a chimpanzee, which is about 4 to 5. Uh, you know, we are on par with uh, uh, vultures and hyenas and other scavengers. And because yeah, of what happened, yeah, so what likely happened was it as you know the primates ran in so what happened three million three million years ago there was a global shift in coolings we dropped temperature dramatically and so the landscape drove changed dramatically to where we went we were in this sort of more kind of a subtropical environment where fruits and stuff like that would have been more available and then it became cold and dry and, and grass took over and so the only food in the grasslands you know unless unless you're adapted to eat grass and there were attempts there were there were human attempts or pre-human attempts Things like Australopithecus robustus and Australopithecus boisei tried to become vegetarians and then they died out and they didn't survive. So the vegan experiment, they already did it and they didn't live. They, they died out as a species. So we don't need to repeat their mistake. But um, as humans or, or sorry, uh, you know, pre-humans sort of became exposed to this new environment uh, and realize that even monkeys and chimpanzees do hunt. They do do a little bit. They do. They are successful at eating. Well, about 3% of the diet comes from meat. Uh, so as humans started to exploit this more, we probably followed around these big cat predators because there was all these fields and fields and fields and savannas and all these prey animals and the predators would eat them. And we know from lion studies, modern lion studies, that they leave a fair bit of meat behind. They leave about 20 kilos behind on the zebra kill. So 20 kilos is quite a bit of meat for a pack of maybe five or six pre-humans. So they would, in theory, would wander up, you know, maybe they'd scare the, maybe if they were brave enough, they could scare the the lions away with sticks and, and things like that way or throw rocks at them, which humans do now. That's actually, we see that Africans do that. They scare lions away with just waving sticks. So could have done that, got the meat. It would have been sitting out for, you know, several hours exposed to bacteria contaminated. So therefore having that uh, strong, strong stomach acid would have allowed us to neutralize those, those, uh, those different uh, contaminants. And, and those that continued to have the strong stomach acid survive because that was their mechanism for getting most of their nutrition. And then, then it became hunting and then we were drying the meat and the dried meat would still get contaminated because it's sitting outside. And so we continued to eat uh, contaminated meat from probably much of our existence. And then fire came in, you know, the, probably the most consistent evidence points around 400,000 years ago, but some people will suggest as far back as 1.5 million. But I think the more compelling evidence shows that maybe 400,000. So for probably 2 million years, we on eating uh, raw meat. And then even after fire was har harnessed, there were still many places in the world where humans still continue to eat raw meat. And in that, in fact, that persists today. We can look at some of these northern tribes where they'll still eat, they'll go slaughter a reindeer and eat it right off the road. They won't, they'll just start eating So kind of crazy to think about. But it is that's, crazy. That's who, that's who humans are. That's who we... I know. I mean, ideally we would be eating, you know, these, these wild animals with possibly the, the bitter greens that you would find that would come off of some shrub off, you know, in the forest. But... And then the odd nut, but imagine as a hunter gatherer, even breaking open a nut, like that would have been really challenging to do. And we, it just would not have happened very often. So if we were actually to eat the way we're supposed to eat, uh, I don't well, think. Let me think about it from, you know, again, uh, did not have the luxury, or I should say the disadvantage of a nutritionist telling them how to eat because yeah. uh, I think a lot of times we screw it up. But I mean, holes, there were you know, protein to, to build structure, but then it was, I mean, it was just simply getting enough calories and energy. And I think the way to do that is one, you know, the, the easy source is, you know, I've got that big mammoth over there and guess what? He's worth about five million calories, you know, when you get the size and they, you know, you, you can, you think of how many berries you would have to get to, you would have to gather uh, to get even close to the same relatively, it would, it would be an, an enormous task. And then you have to realize that prior to processing, most nuts and seeds, which de tend to be calorically rich because they have the, the food supply for the seed to germinate, 
Uh, but those are heavily defended by toxins. And so if you eat a lot, a lot, a lot of raw nuts and seeds, uh, like, you know, raw kidney beans, you know, five raw kidney beans will kill a human. You know, a handful of raw cashews will kill a human. We see this all the time with cassava, raw cassava. They kill a lot of people every year. And so until we develop those advanced processing techniques, which were either cooking or soaking or sprouting or fermenting, and that, wasn't, that didn't come into the human existence for quite some time. Uh, and again, that probably occurred as a result of losing all these big animals that we had to do that. But until we had to do that, there's probably very little reason that we would have done that, you know, based on the amount of foraging required for, for, for the, the meager caloric value. Remember the starchy potatoes that now the tubers back then were highly fibrous. I mean, carrot didn't look like a darn twig. I mean, it was all, it was just fiber. You know, it was like eating a, it was like eating a stick basically with a tiny amount of starch in there. So we have to think, you know, what was available to us? What, what did we have the technology to deal with without harming ourselves? Because like I said, you know, modern seeds, I mean, seeds in general and nuts are difficult to get to. They're well de 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 defended. I mean, the plant does not want you to eat their seeds. I mean, they want you to eat a fruit and pass the seed through your feces so you can spread it. But they don't want you to eat the actual nut or the seed part. And they defend it very heavily with a lot of toxins and so. Yeah, that's that's why it probably wasn't a huge part of the early human diet. Yeah. And so we'd like to talk a lot about weight loss and hormones on this show. So what kind of impact, because I know working with a lot of women that are doing ketogenic diets, I find if they go too low carb or if they go too low calorie, which tends to happen with uh, both keto and carnivore, because you just don't overeat those foods, right? You don't overeat meat. You only eat till you're done, till you're satiated and then that's it. So it tends to lower the caloric intake quite a bit. And I see that affect women's adrenals, you know, the cortisol levels, their thyroid levels. So what have you, what's been your experience with the carnivore diet as far as its impact, both positive and negative on the female hormonal system? Because I know men are, are quite different when it comes to fasting and uh, lower caloric and lower carb diets. Yeah, I think, I think you make a good point. A lot of people do under, under eat. And I think that is probably the number one mistake people make. Now, I, I think the problem, and, and women in particular, because they've been so pressured to, to be a certain size and to look a certain way. And, you know, we see these women where they've been living on salads with the dressing on the side with a lean, skinny piece of chicken on top for a meager amount of protein. Uh, and so they've got this sort of conditioning to, to, un, to, to chronically under eat. And I think many of them, even if they're obese, uh, and this is, a, this is a common misconception. Obesity is still a malnourishment problem. There are people that maybe have a caloric sufficiency, but they have a nutrient deficiency. And I think that's yeah. an important concept. And so when I talk with women, I tell them your number one job from the beginning is to fix your nutrition. And, and, and when I mean fix your nutrition, that is to eat nutrient-rich food to satiety, uh, to sufficiency. And, and, you know, like I said, that maybe meat and in most cases meat tends to be the best way to do it because it's, it's more bioavailable it's better absorbed it's 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 more in line with what we are you know if we, we talk about you 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 are what you eat but really you should eat what you are and you're you're you are a red meat animal that's what human beings are and so it's more of that you get into your system the better you have the building blocks you have the you know the structural materials you know if you're going to build a car it's better to build it out of car parts than it is computer parts and that's how i like in you know plant food where you might have to eat three times as much protein to get the recommended amount of leucine uh, because of the ratios are so different, you know, and there's, you can, you can make all these analogies on that. But so I tell women, you know, you got to eat enough. And, and, and for some of them, it might be three or four pounds of meat a day, which is a lot, you know, and a lot of women, they find that they're voracious and they're, they're scared to eat that much because they're worried about putting on, you know, they've struggled that they've, they've lost 20 pounds or 50 pounds on a ketogenic diet. And by God, they don't want to put on 10 pounds. It's a step backwards. But I think a lot of them have to have to take that step. They have to, because you, when you go on a ketogenic diet, depending on how it's formulated, there's all kinds of horrible ways to do a ketogenic diet. I mean, there's, there's just keto, mm -hmm. ketogenic garbage out there, right? Yeah, yeah. Anything that's got a macronutrient ratio, they'll call ketogenic. It doesn't matter if it's you know, filled with artificial sugars and, and sugar alcohols and, you know, canola oil. Hell, I mean, oil. Whatever, it can yeah. be on a ketogenic diet. And so I think that we have to step away from the concept of, you know, there's an ideal macronutrient ratio. I think there's an idea of, let's get nutrition in the, in the form it comes to and it's food. And so, you know, I think you have to be healthy first to lose weight. You don't lose weight to get healthy. And so you can lose weight on a ketogenic diet or any diet, 
any calorically restricted diet will do it. Often you'll lose muscle. Often you'll lose bone mineral density. Often you'll lose organ mass. Um, and so that may take a period of time to rebuild there. And, you know, again, you talk about hormones. And so caloric deficits, particularly when you're, when you're restricting uh, animal fats in particular, those, those are precursors. Cholesterol, as you know, is a precursor for uh, the sex hormones. Um, you know, with regard to the thyroid, again, if you are under eating, you know, you're going to end up, your body's going to say, hey, look, I need to conserve uh, metabolic output. So it's going to lower your thyroid. And, you know, same thing with the adrenals. And so you have this phenomenon of under eating. And so I think it takes a period of time. And sometimes, I, like when anybody comes to me for, cons for a consultation, if they've never done the diet before, I say the first thing we're doing is we're not losing weight. We're not focusing. It, it may happen spontaneously. But our first goal is, number one, change your relationship with food. Right. I think it is so important that you no longer become a slave to the environment and the food environment because it's everywhere. It's never going away. There's always going to be the office cook plate of cookies, the candy jar, the donuts that are brought in. That's never going to go away. It's always There's always going to be the TV commercial. There's always going to be the smells that smell good. There's always going to be the social occasions. And until you have changed your relationship fundamentally, both physiologically and psychologically, with regard to food, you're never going to get past that trap. And so once you get there, and it may take you two months, it may take you three months, it may take you six months of eating highly nutritious food. And by highly nutritious food, I typically mean meat or eggs or something along those lines. Until you do that, I mean, it's, it's almost, you know, you're just kind of wasting your time. You're, just, you're on another diet. You're on another diet that's, that's, going to, that's going to be doomed to fail. You're going to repeat the same cycle. And so once you've sort of gotten there, and, and you'll know when you get there because all of a sudden you can be hungry and there can be something that otherwise would have been very tempting. Maybe it's a plate of brownies that your sister made or something or someone's brought into the office and you can say, no, no, thanks. I'm good. I can, I can pass that. Uh, once you get to that point, then it's, you know, this sort of restrictive diet, this meat only diet becomes very liberating because then you can pick yeah. and choose when you want to eat those things. And it's not to say that you're on a life sentence where, oh my gosh, I'm destined only to eat dry ground beef for the rest of my life. And I think that's a silly way to look at that. So I think that if you get to the uh, stage where, you know, you can pick her to lose it, and then you can, you know, like I said, you know, my, my daughter had a birthday. Uh, she turned nine a couple weeks ago and she had a cheesecake uh, for her birthday. That's what she wanted. And I used to love cheesecake. I mean, when I was a kid, a little boy growing up, uh, my grandmother would uh, make cheesecake, which I loved. It was one of my favorite desserts in the world. And they asked me, I told my grandmother, when, I, when I'm older, I want to own a cheesecake factory so I can eat this every day. And I mean, I, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. And so I had this little piece of cheesecake and I ate it and was like, eh, no big deal. You know, normally I would have eaten two, three, four, five, six pieces because I was just like, you couldn't stop. And so I had my one piece, said, happy birthday, you know, happy birthday, Nala, daddy loves you. And that was it. And I had no further desire to eat that. I wasn't, it didn't trigger this sort of cycle which so many people see they they have one bite of something sweet and all of a sudden a week yeah. later they're they're at the store buying you know it's a runaway train it's a runaway train and so you get to that situation but you know the thing about the thyroid i think that's a that's an interesting uh sort of thing in, in cortisol because we know that a diet in general uh, can be stressful and so there's a difference yeah. between acute cortisol elevations which i think are just transition to the diet change in the macronutrients change to the fuel you're burning the stress maybe if you're going lower calorie this can be stressful that tends to subside in my experience from what i've seen but the thyroid hormone with low carb diets in general we talk about well we, we certainly we're happy to talk about insulin sensitive because we know there are insulin receptors and then if we're producing less insulin I mean, we need less insulin because our receptors are more receptive to the insulin. So we just need, we need less hormone. I think, and I think there's decent evidence out there. Stephen Finney has got a nice article on this. If you're interested from the, on the Verta, uh, the Verta health blog, where he talks about thyroid and a similar thing happens with thyroid function. And so what we do see a lot of times is that, and again, this is important to distinguish lab markers and clinical symptoms because, you know, clinical symptoms are, are the most important thing. But if you're worried about a lab number, let's say you are, uh, you know, you've got a number that would indicate hypothyroidism, say a T3 level that's lower than the, the, the standard reference range. That for some people would indicate, hey, I need to supplement thyroid. But typically what we see in a low carb situation is that the thyroid hormone receptor regulation goes up. We see less uh, conversion of T4 to T3 by the liver. Uh, and it's because the tissue doesn't require as much thyroid. 
and we often see a normal TSH, a thyroid stimulating hormone, because you know the pituitary you know is is being given the signal that hey I got enough thyroid I don't need to have a T3. Remember these standard reference ranges are determined in a population that by standard is eating a high carb grain based diet and they're arguably kind of sick and so these reference ranges I, I take with a grain of salt depending on yeah. what's going on. So it's more important to talk about what's going on clinically. And so if someone is clearly hypothyroid where they're fatigued all the time, they're cold all the time, they've got you know, the hair is thinning and those things, that's a different situation. But what I've seen more often is somebody will get a lab, they're like, I feel great, it's the best I've felt in 10 years, and their lab will be out of whack, and then all of a sudden they're, they're freak out because they're like, oh my gosh, my labs are going crazy. It's, no, it's probably a normal physiologic adaptation to a non-standard diet, and we've got to remember that dietary reference ranges don't necessarily reflect that. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of people don't realize too, because they'll say, I, I was just out camping with my sister-in-law and she's got a two-year-old and she was concerned because she's like, Karen, all he wants to eat is meat. Like I can't get vegetables into him. And I'm like, listen, meat is more nutrient dense than vegetables. So don't worry about it. People don't realize that. But if you actually look at the nutrient levels of you know, a pound of spinach versus a pound of ground beef, ground beef is going to be more nutrient dense than the spinach is. Yeah, I mean, it's not even close. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not even close. Even if you, I mean, just even if we were to assume that the the uh, the numbers on the nutrient labels were were equivalent, you know, let's say, you know, a pound of spinach or two pounds of spinach has the same amount of protein as six ounces of ground beef, and I'm just making up the numbers here. But, um, you know, if we look at the volume, you'd have to eat a tremendously more amount of spinach. But say you could do that and you could get some more, you know, equal amount of protein. Then we have to look at the quality of that protein. The quality and the bioavailability, and much of that protein is bound up in the fiber. Much of, the, pro, much of the, the minerals are bound up in the fiber and the oxalates that come with the spinach. And so even what's on the label does not get absorbed by your body. And so even beyond that, and then if we say, well, we get some of that protein, say we get 60% of, 60 of the protein in, then we have to look at the, the ratios of that protein, which amino acids are actually in there. And, we, we, you know, and again, there are some amino acids that are much more difficult to get and much more required, leucine, lysine being some of the two prominent ones uh, that are very important for things like muscle growth and muscle protein synthesis. And so it's, it's even more lopsided than we think it is. So if, if, if the kid is eating, my kids are the same way, I push meat on them. I don't make them eat a carnivore diet, but they're, by darn, they're going to eat a lot of meat. Same. <laughs> and they do, and they generally enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's honestly, yes. my kids really enjoy it. And, they, and, and unfortunately, for me, because I taught my daughters, and I've got two daughters and two sons, and I taught my daughters about ribeye steaks, and this is a this is a rib cap, and this is where the really good part is. And every time I cook one of those, my daughters will come out of the woodwork and they'll stand by me and say, "Daddy, we want that part." <laughs> I'm sacrificing the best part of the steak to my daughters because I love them. But um, yeah, I mean, I would if a kid wants to eat meat, I'd say more power. Here, here's another serving, and then if they and then if they want to eat something else, uh, then I give them something else, you know. And it may and more often than not, for my kids, it's a piece of fruit you know, or some, or some yogurt or, you know, something like that. And it's very rarely, I don't feed them junk food. I, you know, I don't even feed them the seed oils and this sugary crap. Um, and they're very happy. And, you know, and to them, uh, my little girl, I mean, a, a bowl of raspberry is a huge, huge treat. Whereas the normal kid, I mean, real raspberry, well, that's not sweet enough. You know, it doesn't have the artificial flavors and, and ingredients and, and, you know, normal kids will turn their nose up in a bowl of raspberries. Whereas my daughter thinks it's, a wonderful Delicious. treat, yeah. which is what it should be. It should be a treat. It shouldn't be a staple. And they get their nutrition from meat. And I think that's one take-home message. If we realize that meat that's is right, human yeah. food, we preference it, we prioritize it, we make it the focal point, not a condiment. These guys like Mark Hyman and these people are out there trying to say, make it a con condiment, which I think is <laughs> that's worse than the vegan message, quite honestly, Ridiculous. because I think <laughs> the reason I think it's worse than the vegan message is because people are likely to fall for it. They're likely to do it. They're likely to cut back. Uh, and get their their tiny scrap of nutrition, you know, bounded, you know, embedded in a sea of inferior nutrition. And whereas veganism, most people think it's too crazy. I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. Those are crazy people who are out there with their science protesting. So I'll eat the condom meat, and I'll do my part to, to to virtue signal and think I'm saving the environment when really I'm not doing anything. I think the opposite. I think you should make meat the focal point of the diet. That should be the majority of your plate, and the other stuff becomes flavor, decoration, entertainment, social concession. And I think that makes a huge difference. But yeah, I mean, some I people, some people need to go full bore carnivore and just that's all they eat for autoimmune issues or, or something like that. And uh, I would say that 
uh, many people find that pleasantly sustainable, surprisingly. And, and I, I just, I, I've never do not look forward to a steak. I've never had a situation where I sit down and say, damn, I got to eat another, you know, not another tenderloin, <laughs> not another ribeye or something like that. Or, you know, I just, I've never had that situation, you know, but. And but, you're really pro, like you really say that it's the red meat that needs to be eaten, not the chicken and turkey, fish, seafood. Well, I think, you know, again, let's go back to evolution. So you and I are out in the, out in the, you know, the, the, whatever, the forest, the, 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 the sort of European forest 50,000 years ago. Uh, our technology at that time is spear technology, right? And we've got some big, slow-moving grazing animals that don't run away because they're too big. They don't, they don't think these puny humans can do anything to them, right? Because they haven't been, they, had, they didn't evolve with us. And that's what happened. You know, that's why there's still African elephants and the elephants in the rest of the world got wiped out because those guys didn't see us coming. So, so we've got this, we've got these big, slow-moving animals, and then we've got birds that, and we've got a spear. And, and can you imagine how hard it would be to kill a bird with a spear that can fly and yeah. how many you'd have to kill to equal the, the, the big giant grazing animal. So we would have, and they would have been lean. These weren't like corn right. fed turkeys that are, right, yeah, they'd been lean. These are lean little, little quail or whatever they were. Right, right. Exactly. So we would have went for the big juicy fatty animals every time. And those tend to be red meat animals. And so I think that's what our evolution does. And I think, you know, again, this is something that once you experience it, you know, and it's not that I think chicken is awful or, and I do eat some seafood from time to time, but, I find it doesn't satisfy me in the way that, that red meat does. And I think the majority of the people that do this diet over the long haul find it the exact same thing. I think it's just a evolutionary signal that's congruent with how we evolved. And I think that's why most people sort of lean to it. And unfortunately for the cow, they're the closest thing we have to the mammoth. I mean, we, yeah. we, we, we're not going to be eating mammoths anytime soon. Although there's some rumor that they might be able to bring them back. Which, but I don't think we'll be allowed to eat them. But anyway, here's a little side thing that is so funny because you're talking about mammoths, and I did a. This was probably like 20 years ago. I went and saw this hypnosis person that did like hypnosis to to look to see what your past lives were, and it. I just remember it was not working, and I'm just lying there, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not being hypnotized here, and then suddenly out of nowhere, all I saw was a mammoth, and a man with long hair with a spear in his hand. And I'm like, where did that come from? And I'm like, well, maybe I was a mammoth killer back in the day. I don't know. Isn't that weird? Like, where would it have come from? So I don't know if it worked or who knows, my imagination. But Well, I mean, I'm just looking at you, you've got a fairly kind of a Northern European feature. So most likely your, your ancestors did kill mammoths. You know, it's interesting. There was a group of... Uh, uh, people called the Gravedians that lived in Central Europe about 30,000 years ago. And they were prodigious mammoth hunters. They were like, you know, they just, they just were just, you know, killed them on an industrial scale. I mean, they lived on mammoths. They were the tallest humans to ever populate the earth. As far as we know, their, their skeletal remains were 30,000 years ago. Average height back then, the average height was about six foot two for a male. And so the, the tallest people in the world today is modern uh, uh, the Netherlands and in and, and Croatia and these people that their average height is six foot. So fit 30,000 years ago, we had people that were two inches taller than the average. And so that an average at six foot two, it means there are probably people walking around that were six, eight, six, nine, seven feet tall uh, that were these mammoth hunters and so these ginormous people uh, living on. And again, we see that across the board as population nutritional health gets better. That is to say, as people have access to better nutritional quality, they are taller as a, as a as a as a general population. So when we look at places like uh, Southeast Asia and, and South America, and we look back on the, like the Mayans and some of these early cultures uh, during the same parent period of time, where they had access to fruits and mostly plant based uh, food and less of these big you know cold animal things, their their average height was like you know for a male it was like four foot ten and stuff like that, as opposed to six two where these mammoth hunters are. Wow, there you go. Well, I was one of them. Clearly. <laughs> so Sean, where can people find you and what's your book about that's coming out? What are people going to find in this book? Yeah. So the book's called the carnivore diet. So straightforward title by Sean Baker, MD. And it's basically, um, uh, you know, the beginning of the book kind of talks about my story a little bit. The publisher really wanted me to do some autobiographical stuff. So I included it in there. I didn't, I didn't put it in initially. I said, Hey, put some of your autobiography in there. Cause it's interesting. So I included that in there. And then, uh, then it gets into, again, some of the stuff we've been talking about, evolutionary sort of concepts 
historical concepts, some of the uh, um, uh, sort of biochemical and, and uh, you know, some of the literature that would support why meeting is good, meeting is good, dispelling some of the myths around meeting, like red meat is going to cause cancer and, and heart disease and all that stuff. And then why plants may be problematic for certain people. It talks about a lot of these diseases that are getting better and, and the rationale behind that. I've got a lot of success stories in there. Uh, and then I get into how, the how to implement the diet, different ways, different strategies, where you're coming from, some of the issues that people sometimes run into, how to deal with those issues. Um, you know, and then uh, I'm trying to think what else is in there and just some, just some kind of basic stuff around the diet, you know, different uh, uh, aspects of, of what's going on and then kind of where we're headed with that. So that's kind of the, the premise of the book. Um, it's kind of an introduction. It's going to be kind of written as a, you know, for most people, most people still haven't heard of this. And so it's kind of a broad audience appeal, uh, you know, and there, and there are, there will be other books that will delve a little deeper into some of the uh, more sort of evolving science on that. But uh, this is designed for the average person who's kind of wants to know about it, a little curious. It might be for somebody who's never heard of this before. And so I think it'll appeal to, to, to a relatively broad audience. Um, it'll be out in August. As far as finding me, um, I'm on social media fairly Often I'm on Instagram with uh, at Sean. So it's Sean S H A W N Baker B A K E R nineteen sixty seven on Twitter. I'm S Baker M D. Um, I've got a YouTube channel. It's Sean Baker, and you can type in Sean Baker Carnivore Diet or something like that. It'll pop up. Lots. And then we've got a Facebook group called the World Carnivore Tribe, which I started, which is about thirty. I think we're about thirty two thousand people wow. in that group doing carnivore, and so it's. Uh, Lots of support for it anyways, hey? Yeah, no, there's yeah, support. I, mean, we, I even started a, a vegan recovery group. So I've got, I've got 1,500 members or 1,600 members of ex-vegans that have left the vegan diet to, to not to necessarily go carnivore, but to inc include meat back in the diet. And that's a great, great place for uh, ex-vegans to kind of come in a hassle-free environment where they're not attacked by either ex-vegans or vegan right. haters. And uh, uh, so it's been, uh, you know, a good you know, good place. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, he, you can pre-order his book on Amazon right now. This is going to be coming out, you know, relatively quickly here. So you'll have a couple of weeks before it actually comes out on the shelf, but you can pre-order it now so you can guarantee that copy. So we'll put that in the show, in the show notes in the link. So thank you. thank you. Thank you, Sean, for this great conversation. And I really hope that if you're listening to this and you're just got that little bit of interest in it, that you check out Sean, you check out our, more information about the carnivore diet. Like I said, I've been using it here in my practice for the last year with really great results. I, I have not found anything to reverse insulin resistance as quickly as the carnivore diet. So it's pretty amazing stuff. So thank you, Sean, uh, for, for the chat. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Karen. And I look forward to hearing this when it comes out. <laughs>